You know, I had a hard time finding the slide for the message today, but I, I had this one, great is, is thy faithfulness, Second Corinthians. But <clears throat> the Lord is faithful to those called by his name. And um, the title of the message today is Destruction of Nineveh. If you'd have been here for the last seven, seven or so weeks, I started out with a with a series of messages on Jonah. And Jonah <coughs> being given the task of preaching to Nineveh, that great wicked city, and he didn't want to do it, so he ran away. God prepared the storm, God prepared the great fish, God prepared uh, everything for him. And he was still bitter at the end. But he should have not, he should have held on because about a hundred years later, the Ninevites who had repented and started following God, I won't say they became Hebrews or proselytes, but they were, they were believing in one true living God because they repented and were spared. But about a hundred years later, they were back to their own wickedness again. So I'm gonna read you a couple things and then we're gonna hit, hit the scripture. But it says, for everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. That's from Luke 12, 48. Nineveh had been given the privilege of knowing the one true God under Jonah's preaching. This great Gentile city had repented and God had granted or graciously stayed his judgment. However, a hundred years later, Nahum proclaims the downfall of the same city. The Syrians have forgotten their revival and have returned to their there are habits of violence, adultery, arrogance. As a result, Babylon will so destroy the city that no trace of it will remain. The prophecy fulfilled in painful detail. So remember that big picture. That picture. You know, imagine that not a trace of that was found until in the 1900s when archaeologists dug up a little bit of stuff and they said, we think this is where Nineveh was. So that was the destruction of that great city. But Nineveh, the capital city of Assyria, uh, the capital city of the Assyrian Empire, flourished from 800 BC to 612 BC. It was located on the left bank of the Tigris River in northern Mesopotamia, which today is Iraq. The timing of Nahum's prophecy is probably between 612 BC and 622 BC. Well, after the destruction of Israel in 722 BC by the Assyrians. Now, the northern kingdom of Israel, well, let me rephrase that. The northern kingdom, which was Israel, and the southern kingdom, which was Judah, the northern kingdom had gotten so wicked, the God that took the people he spared, the Nevites, the Assyrians, he spared them, they repented, he spared them from destruction. But about 100 years later, he used them to come in and conquer uh, Israel and take those people out as captives. Well, the way God works with his people, Israel and the church, is when the people of Israel get out of line, start following the idols, doing things they're not supposed to be doing, well, God will go out and he'll say, pick out the people who are more wicked than his people are, and he'll use those wicked people to judge and discipline Israel or Judah. Well, the other thing he does is those people he used who were wicked, he will take them and he will get somebody else. He'll bring somebody else up to punish those people for what they did to his people. Mm -hmm. Even though he brought them in to do it, he still doesn't absolve them of the penalty for putting upon his people. And that's what you're going to see today in this message. And as I said, well after the destruction of Israel in 722 by the uh, Assyrians, but the fall of Nineveh was in 612, and the final desolation of the Assyrian Empire was in 609 BC. They were destroyed by an alien force of the Medes and the Chaldeans with the Babylonians. The Babylonians would become the major power in the region. Under the leadership of Nebuchadnezzar, they would dominate everyone. They would destroy the southern kingdom of Judah and drag the inhabitants away as slaves. That's where we get 
the book of Daniel from him, is he, him and his uh, three friends, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were, were young Jewish boys that were drug off and were schooled into things of the Babylonians. And you know, we won't go into Daniel today, but uh, you know, like I said, Nebuchadnezzar, the, the Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar would dominate the region, dominate everyone. They were, the southern kingdom was under the control of Babylon. Now remember, we had, the northern kingdom was conquered by Assyria and they were taken off as slaves. Babylon comes in and they conquer Assyria. And that's what's going to happen in the scripture. They, they con conquer Assyria and then they become the, the dominant power. But if you've ever seen the statue that Nebuchadnezzar had a dream where the head was gold, the, the chest and arms were silver, the legs and thighs were uh, bronze and feet were steel, or iron, not steel, but iron. And uh, if you, you th get that picture in your mind of that statue, if you take a hat and put on it, that would have been Assyria because they, these came down in order of the kingdoms. But, um, but just as the Lord used Assyria to dis discipline Israel, he used Babylon to discipline Judah. But even Babylon wasn't, wasn't free to, to be all they wanted to be forever because remember the, the Syrians uh, disciplined uh, Israel, the northern kingdom, Babylon disciplined Assyria. Well, Babylon does, uh, disciplines the southern kingdom of Judah. But what happens with them? Well, the Medes and the Persians come in and conquer the uh, Babylonians. So none of these people who are, who are putting upon Jerusalem, Israel, they're not getting away scot-free. They're being taken care of. And that's what all this is about today. But Nahum, Nahum chapter 2, verse 1 and 2 says, He who scatters, which being God, has come up before your face. Man the fort, watch the road, strengthen your flanks, fortify your power mightily. For the Lord will restore the excellence of Jacob like the excellence of Israel. For the emptiers have emptied them out and ruined their vine and branches. So God is the scatterer. But when it's got in here, man the forward, watch the road, strengthen your flanks. What that is, it's really truly sarcasm. Sarcasm from God. Because no matter what they do, no matter what the Assyrians do, it's not going to be enough. It's never going to be enough. But he who scatters is the Lord because he defeats by turning countrymen against themselves. He scatters by sowing confusion among the enemy. Because of the power of God to make things happen for his people. You know, Miss Terry and I discuss this a lot. Why is it that all that God did for the Jewish people, the Israelites, the and Judah, what all they did, why is it that they always fall into disobedience? They always did all through through their history. Even after they were brought out of the, out of Egypt by Moses led by a column of fire in the daytime and a column of smoke, or a column of smoke in, in the daytime and a column of fire at night. They were led out and God provided all their needs, but they still rebelled against him. You know, you just have a hard time grasping that, but don't we rebel against him too? But the sarcasm in these statements stand out because the victory is the Lord's and no one else's. Man the floor, watch the road, strengthen your flanks, fortify your power. These statements are followed by Yahweh's promise to restore Israel to their former glory. Yahweh has a has a build back better plan that actually does as advertised. So we see that God has done the things that He's He's intended with His people. They've cried out to Him for rescue, and He's faithful to rescue them, just as he was when they were in Egypt. They cried out to him, 
And, um, and he came in and sent Moses to, to lead him out. But now moving down to Nahum chapter 2, verse 3, it says, The shields of his mighty men are made red. The valiant men are in scarlet. The chariots come with flaming torches in the day, and, uh, and the day of his preparation, and the spears are brandished. So it says, red, scarlet, flaming torches. These images speak of blood, violence, and warfare. Isaiah refers to the custom of the Assyrians have of rolling their garments in blood before a battle. And Isaiah 9, 5 says, For every warrior's sandal from the noisy battle and garments rolled in blood will be used for burning and fuel for the fire. What, what is verse is saying, uh, Isaiah 9, 5 is saying, is that all the things that they do, and, and they did these all these things in blood to terrify the people they were after. And what the scripture is saying is all these things will be rolled up and just burnt for fuel, just to, to fuel the fire. But they did this to strike terror in the hearts of their opponents. Here the tables will be turned. Their adversaries will burn the rolled up blood-soaked garments as fuel for the fire. While others would have shields, chariots, and spears, the people of Nineveh would be bathed in blood, their own blood. They would have and have all in place for defense of the city, but to no avail, all would perish. All would perish because the battle was the Lord's. It was not theirs to win, it was theirs to lose. It was, as soon as God set this in motion, they had already lost, they just didn't know it. Verse four of chapter two of Nahum says, the char cherish rage in the streets. They jostle one another in the broad roads. They seem like torches. They run like lightning. The chariots rage. The, the Assyrians use chariots as formidable war machines. The prophecy of the chariot drivers underlies, or the proficiency of the chariot drivers underlies the imagery of the verse. But as in the case of the shields and the spears, the ch uh, chariots of Nineveh would not prevail. No matter how fast they drove, they would not prevail against Yahweh. Important in this verse is the overwhelming power of Assyria is no match for the omnipotent Lord. No matter what they had, no matter what they brought out, they were not going to, to be victorious. You know, that's why right now we, we have a, I, I consider him a, a madman who's threatening nuclear war, God is not going to allow it. His word does not say say that. There's not a place in, in his word for it at this time for that to happen. And I believe before that happens, he'll be stopped. He'll be taken out. He'll be removed from power or something. But God's word does not say that we're going to destroy ourselves. Oh, yes, we will by our action bring our own, our own destruction, but not that way. Not before the church is pulled out anyhow. Now verse 5 and 6 of Nahum chapter 2 says, He remembers his nobles. They stumble in their walk. They make haste to their walls. Or to her walls. And the defense is prepared. The gates of the rivers are opened. And the palace is dissolved. The people of Nineveh will will be so overwhelmed by the futility of their resistance that they will stumble. They will stumble as drunkards with no recourse. Remembering his nobles is another case of sarcasm because none are worthy, none are noble but God. Gates of the rivers. The destruction of Nineveh is believed to have taken place when the besiegers entered the city, entered the city through the flooded waterways. The attack came at flood time when rivers undermined the walls and defenses of the city. Archaeologists have found evidence of flood debris that may be associated with the destruction of the city. Thus the words of Nahum are fulfilled exactly. The instrument of Nineveh's destruction would be the Medes and the Babylonians. Now it's, when you look at this and looking at uh, the book of Daniel, the Medes, they were evidently pretty resilient people because they came in with uh, Babylon and they defeated Assyria 
And they came in with the Persians and defeated Babylon. So the Medes, they, I guess they could uh, uh, allow with anybody. But 7 and 8 of Nahum chapter 2 says, It is decreed, she shall be led away captive, she shall be brought up, and her maidservant shall lead her as with the voice of doves, beating their breast. Nineveh of old was like a pool of water. Now they flee away. Halt, halt, they cry. No one turns back. Who is it who decreed the destruction of Nineveh and Assyria? It was God. The Lord, him, Lord of heaven himself, what he has decreed will come to fruition in his time. You know, um, when Jesus, right before he ascended, he said he was coming back. Well, the, the disciples and the apostles, they thought he meant like tomorrow. Well, he is coming back tomorrow, but every day we, we, we go into tomorrow, then the next day is tomorrow. So God's got his timetable set, and it's not going to change because we want it to change or we don't want it to change. Jesus is coming back for the church at that appropriate time, that exact time, and it's going to be... The last person that needs to hear the gospel, whether he accepts it or rejects it, that last person hears it, that's going to be the signal. That's when Jesus is coming back to pull the church out of here and the Holy Spirit's going to leave. You know, when we talk, preachers talk about the Holy Spirit and we talk about the rapture of the church, we, we talk about when the, Holy, when the church is gone, the restraint on evil is going. If we look at the world and we say, my goodness, if the church and the Holy Spirit are restraining evil now, what's it going to look like when it's when they're gone? It's going to look pretty nasty. It's going to be pretty bad, pretty gnarly. And it's going to be the worst thing we can probably ever think of. But what we need to understand is that all this stuff is on God's timetable, and, and we as finite individuals, we just look at right now. We can't look ahead and look back and do us any good. But God, He looks, He looks at right now, then, and back then, and He He never misses misses a beat. What He says is happening will happen. And that's why I said that uh, it is decreed. It's decreed by God what was going to happen to them. It was decreed that. All the things that he said was going to happen did happen. But the captives, as I said, will be led away as defeated captives. That's, that was what this part of the scripture said. Because they took the uh, Israelites out of the northern kingdom. They led them out captive. Now they're going to be led out as captives. Then it talks about the panic and distress cries of those would do little, it would do little good for them to cry out because when Jonah went to Nineveh to preach repentance to them, they repented. But Nahum didn't go to Nineveh, to, to Nineveh and say, hey, look, God will give you one more chance. God gave you your chance, and you changed. You went and fell right back into what you were doing before. So I'm not coming here to say you have a choice. God is going to destroy you. God did not give Sodom and Gomorrah a choice. They made their choice when they decided to walk in direct opposition to God. When they did that, their choice was made. That's why a lot of people think, we we'll listen to it on the radio on the way in this morning. People say, at 12 o'clock, I'll, I'll ask Jesus to forgive my sin, I'll repent, I'll do all these things and I'll be saved. But death comes to see you at 1030. What are you going to do? Now is the perfect time to come to faith in Jesus Christ. The voice of Dub signifies her utter, utterly total defeat and helplessness. The picture of the maidservants leaving is another slap at the mighty, invincible Assyrian army. The, for women to be leaving the, the march, how far have the mighty actually fallen? They're not able to stand before an avenging God who brings justice to the wicked. Now, verse 9 and 10 of Nahum chapter 2 says, 
Take the spoil of silver. Take the spoil of gold. There is no end of treasures or wealth of these desirable prizes. She is simply desolate and, and a waste. The heart melts and the knees shake. Much pain is in every side. And all her faces are drained of color. Now, the spoil we're talking about is the spoil that they had taken from peoples they had conquered. But I want you to take a look at a picture of the Israelites, the Hebrews, starting, well, let's start with Abraham. Let's, let's start with Abraham. We, we don't want to go back as far as Adam and Eve because they came out with their, with their, their loincloths and stuff about all they had. But Abraham, every time he disobeyed God and went into Egypt or somewhere, and when he came out, he came out richer than when he went in. When the Israelites came out of Egypt, they came out richer than when they went in because the Egyptians were throwing stuff at them. You know, and that's what God put in her, throwing stuff at them, take this and go, take it and go. So every time the Hebrews, the Jews, were, were conquered and taken away, when they came back out, when they were, were being restored by God, they were blessed and they brought in more treasure from the conquerors. And it's the same thing with Nineveh. When they were being led back out, they were taking all this stuff, this silver and gold that they had stolen from them and other people, and they were taking it back as spoil. So God always prospered them in the Old Testament. Though, though he took retribution against them for their unfaithfulness, when they cried out to him, he was faithful to forgive them and to bring them back into their land. But he always brought them back with more than what they left with. But there seemed to be no end to the loot that could be found within the walls of, of Nineveh and, and Assyria. But they had robbed Samaria and the cities of Israel. Nonetheless, even Nineveh was exhausted of its treasures. At long last, it was empty. This, once again, is Yahweh's justice and recompense for his chosen people. Every time the Hebrews were taken captive in the end, they came out of captivity with their captors wealth. He prospers, prospers them while they were obedient, and even for a time when they're in rebellion. When God let the Assyrians come in and, and take out the northern kingdom because they were so wicked, he was also telling the southern kingdom, look, you guys need to get your act together. I'm going to let you stay down here a little bit longer, but if you keep up and keep on messing up, then I'm going to do the same to you as I did to the northern kingdom. You're going to have to pay that penalty. Well, they, they had a good king, a bad king, a good king, but mostly they had bad kings in the southern kingdom. So they ended up being taken into captivity in Babylon. But we, we're not on that today, but it's something to keep in the back of your mind. But none of them will be completely laid waste for the evil they did to God's chosen people. And you can't stress out enough that if you look around the Middle East, the only country, nation, that's been a nation for as far back as you can look in, in human history is Israel. All the other ones around them are latecomers. All the ones, the, the, if you've been to Philistine lately, have you been to Canaan? Well, Canaan's where the Israelites are. But there are all these places that came against Israel, they're no more. That should be a, a wake-up call for the enemies of Israel. It should be a wake-up call for Israel, too, that while, when they're faithful to God, that God will be faithful to them and look after them and take care of them. But when they're falling to idolatry and other things, then he's not above discipline. I used the analogy last week about a parent, a good parent who takes his child out who, who's disobedient, he spanks him with a switch. But when he's done with, with, the, with that punishment, with that discipline, he takes that switch and he busts it up and he throws it into the fire so it doesn't do any more harm. And that's the way God's, God's method is, is he disciplines his people, but the ones who he disciplined, disciplined them with, 
He deals with them also. They don't get away free. But Nahum 2, 11 and 12 says, Where is the dwelling of the lions and the feeding place of the young lions where the lion walked, the lioness and the lion cub? And no one made them afraid. The lion tore in pieces enough for his cubs, killed for his whole lioness, filled his canvas or filled his caves with prey, and his dens with flesh. Well, first off, Nineveh was a city of lions, or at least it was thought of. Now, when I read, read this, now we all know from watching PBS and nature shows and stuff that it's the lioness who goes out and gets the kill and brings them home to the man, to the male lion, the one with the big fuzzy neck. But this this is completely opposite because it says the, the lion tore apart and came back and uh, to his lioness and his lion cubs. Well, we know that in, in nature that the, the king of the beast is sitting, sitting on his backside waiting on him to be served. You notice I don't have a big fuzzy neck. <laughs> Never mind. But, but anyway, despite the horrors the line of Nineveh brought to other nations, it was no longer feared by anyone. And that's what it's saying, that when God got done with them, the, the fierceness of the Assyrians, of the Ninevites, the, that fierceness was gone. They didn't have anything left because God had taken it away from them. And the Lord had neutered the ferocious lion and turned it into a tamed house cat. Looking for the nation of Assyria or its capital, none of it today, you will only find where they think it was. And remember what that picture representation at the beginning, that big, that was a big place with a lot of stuff going on. To sit there and say, well, we think this is where it was. I mean, to me, that's pretty, uh, pretty amazing that it was so utterly destroyed that you look for bits and pieces of it because you're not gonna find a big place of it. The embattled location of Syria, the nation today, can be located on the map, but it's not a reflection of Assyria. And it's not even a descendant of Assyria. But God, God doesn't play around. When he, when he makes a decision, he, he sticks with it. And just as he sent Jonah to preach to the Ninevites repentance, and they repented down to the, the least of them to the greatest. They all repent. They all put on sackcloth and sit in ashes and they fasted and they were saved because of God's grace. But how many times do we fail to see God's grace when, when it stares right in the face? Finally, the last verse, Nahum chapter 2 verse 13 says, Behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts, I will burn your chariots and smoke, and the sword shall devour your young lions. I will cut off your prey from the earth, and the voice of your messenger shall be heard no more. So basically, in verse 13, and we haven't even got to chapter 3 yet. We won't do that till next week. But chapter 3 is going to wrap this stuff up. But although the Babylonians conquered the city, they were only God's instrument. You know, God used who he wanted to, to destroy Nineveh and Assyria. He could have used a little boy down the road with a stick and a, and a hoop. He could have used them to beat them all to death with that stick. But he used Babylon. But Nineveh's greatest foe was the Lord of hosts himself. The Lord is not above using the deeds of the wicked to fulfill his will for the restoration of his people. The Lord doesn't cause evil, but he does use it to our good. When something bad happens to us, it is to draw us closer to God, not to punish. We will each stand before one of the two thrones of judgment. He, sits, he who sits on the judgment seat, or he who sits in judgment on both thrones is the Lord Jesus, the righteous judge. We will either see him at the Lamb's judgment seat of rewards, or we'll see him at the white throne of justice 
the justice, uh, the seat for uh, unbelievers. And we need to be sure that we know which one we're going to be in. It would be a horrible thing to go through your life thinking because when I was five, five years old, I got baptized in the church or this happened or my mom and dad were Christians. My grandparents were Christians. All these things, so I must be a Christian too. None of that will get you saved. And if you, fact, if you look at the story of Nineveh, you'll see that when they repented, God didn't have any grandchildren. When those people repented, 120,000 people repented, if every one of them repented, which it, Scripture says they did, but those who came after that 120,000, the issue of the, from that 120,000, what did they do? What did they do? Did they, did they look back and say, you know what? Before they repent, our, our ancestors repented, <clears throat> we had all this stuff, we conquered all this and that, you know, maybe we want to get back to that. So they got back to the, the wicked ways of, because people are not bringing up their children in the proper fear and reverence of the Lord. And I impress upon you, you say you had three children, I impress upon you to bring them, find a good Bible preaching church. Don't find one that tickles your ear and lets you get off and tell you that God loves you no matter what you do. He does. But we can't, we can't count on that for anything other than the white throne judgment because God loves us, but when we take that last breath, where we sit with Jesus is where we'll be. We'll either be in heaven or hell. There's no second chance in hell, and no matter what, how good a person you are, it will not get you into heaven. If you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior today, that's something you need to come, come to terms with. But I tell you now, you don't want to be at the White Throne Judgment because it leads to the lake of fire, eternal separation from God. Next slide, Mr. Terry. The first ever cordless phone was created by God. He named it prayer. It never loses its signal, and you never have to recharge it. You can use it anywhere, and that's true. You know, Paul said, pray, pray without ceasing. You say, well, how can I do that? And I, I notice myself walking around cutting grass and doing something around the house, and, and I'll find myself talking to God about stuff. You know, I said, well, I'm sorry I did that, and uh, thank you for not... Uh, dropping that on my head, but um, it, it, it's just talking to God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Nahum, who uh, he had a tough job. He didn't have a tough job as, uh, as Noah did, or not Noah, but Jonah. But Lord God, he, um, he took God's message to the Ninevites, to the Assyrians. He took the message and he didn't take a message of this or that. He said, this is what's going to happen to you. This is what God's going to do to you. This is what you have earned. You have earned it because of what you did to my people, Israel, the northern kingdom. This is what you did, and this is what's going to happen to you. And as we, we discussed and we read, Nineveh, that great wicked city, and it was a great great city. It's hard to find two, two little pebbles that you could say came from there. That's how utterly destroyed it was. But Lord God, we lift up all the people, the students of Fessy, we lift our families up back home, we, we lift everyone up that we can think of, the ones we know here, the ones we've never met. And Lord God, we just, we're here to minister to anyone who comes to Fessy, staff, students, uh, any visitor, anybody who can get on campus. Lord God, we thank you for your blessings and all the things you do. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.